the kind of the kind of the kind of the kind of the the last time. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so maybe we just start. Yep. Yeah. Do you want either one of them? That's a bit of 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 a we can go from this preliminary work that we've done in generating our objects in, in terms of narrative texts uh, in, into a um, 3,000 word um, text that has more analysis in it, although <coughs> um, the analysis uh, and the narrative not separate, they were in together is what we're looking for. Um, yesterday we spent a lot of time thinking about objects and objects and their multiplicities and we uh, uh, looked at the uh, multiplicity of governments of origins of contemporary modern governments um, so I want to uh, say a bit more about governance uh, and I want to tie it up to a contention and it's my contention and about uh, something that I see happening. Um, if you remember my talk for the symposium, I talked about trying to name something. This is... Uh, also part of that struggle to name something, feeling that if we name it, we'll be better off. Uh, and uh, Beth very properly picked me up and said, well, you're saying that there's something new here, but other people have said, well, it's just an odd extension of something old. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, the answer to that is, well, they're not... Uh, they're not really incommensurable positions, uh, except I think what I'm saying, I'm identifying difference and suggesting that there are samenesses or connections within that difference, whereas uh, uh, others might be much more inclined to say, oh, it's really just the same, but there's this difference emerging. So is difference within sameness, or is sameness constituted within difference? Mm -hmm. And I, my methodology is always to go for that latter move. So, um, and so my suggestion is this might work as a contention that we can use to knit our various stories of objects together. Uh, because, uh, uh, and, but also as, as a tension that might help us uh, uh, in a way, um, extend and expand our object stories. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> just looking at governance, um, going back to the first day, I suggested governance as a form of generative discipline and as generating subjects and objects, and not that they're they can emerge, they're constituted as uh, uh, entities working in different modes, if you like. Uh, so subjects are as much constituted as knowing subjects as objects are as constituted as known objects. Um, and many other things as well, of course. Then, uh, <coughs> I'm thinking about in-place collectives. So, um, the, the, I mean, many sociologists would say, oh, we're just concerned with the small scale, uh, even if the small scale is uh, uh, an education system, it's really very specific uh, 
and points within the education system, like a pathway or something like that. And <clears throat> what that generativity is doing is distributing goods and bads. And it's be good for us if we have a a reliable way of uh, getting at, seeing, articulating uh, what what the goods are, what the bads are, and how they've been distributed, and who who benefits and who loses, and so on. So, so in a way, that that's the that's where we're trying to go with our stories. Uh, where um, whether we get there or not, we, we don't know. Can I ask what the difference between generating goods and bads and distributing them? How do they how do they get distributed, or is that an empirical question? I think it's an empirical question, um, and I I think that generating and distributing are not separate. Okay. Uh, um, but I think if you just look at emergence. Things emerge undistributed, and in the process of their emergence, they get distributed. Right, and that's part of governance yes. as, as the world is unfolding. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so um, I think what I, I want to add to that today is this idea of sets of practices or Yesterday we were talking about them as sets of knowledge practices. Um, to today I'll suggest that sets of practices constituting knowability, uh, constituting objects uh, and their knowing in one moment uh, uh, is constituting knowability. And that, that I think is what uh, can be called a political technology. Of governance. So uh, the reading that we've got for today uses this term political technology. I, I don't think it's something new. I think we've been talking about it, we just haven't been using that term political technology. So you can substitute that for knowledge practices? Yes, or practices of constituting knowability more easily. So they're not okay. entirely mesh. Yeah. Um, can, can you say something about knowability? Is that different? Is that different to being known about? Uh, I think um, mm, being known about is uh, something that uh, particular objects in a mode of particular for particular objects of it. Uh, knowability is a more general way of talking about the technologies that generate things as knowable. Mm -hmm. The thing that made that clear to me is that was when Helen was talking about the clan, saying of course clans exist independently of people, but they're actually produced as facts. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it originally it exists as a clan, but then it's produced as a fact. In, in those technologies, and then we start dealing with them, they become part of the whole regime of governance. And those strange numbers, like the percentage um, value that will be saved in 20 years' time, or something like that, this notion that we could know that that's a knowable yes. object. And, and my contention was that. Um, we've really only got a story about one way of constituting knowability, and I think uh, several more have just plotted, and it's time we get names for them. So this is my story now. Different regimes of knowability, different political technologies uh, by which clams come to be known, uh, and clams for Clams participate, clams are participants, if you like, uh, in all those three funny numbers, or three numbers, or enumerated entities that I talk about. Okay, so so the, this sense that 
we've got a pretty good story about what is gener what are generally called modern facts. Uh, and that was a name coined some time ago in science studies, and it's all about. Uh, and so that's the long-lived corals. The modern facts tend to be indexical or indexes. They've got corals down here and a number up here, is the <coughs> and they're about the past. Um, but then we've got those other numbers, uh, the 42% increase in, uh, and the 25 million, the uh, value of ecosystem services. They're not indexes. Um, and I think we need to recognise that they are different to that usual way of constituting modern facts that are comfortably indexical. And so um, it's that in a way is behind my contention. So okay, that, I mean we might decide not to go this way. I, I'm not. It's certainly not a prescription that that we could do this, but we have to do something like this. In order both to expand, to get attention that will help us expand our stories and get attention that will help us tie our stories together in some way enough. They don't have to be tied together very much, but enough. Um, so I'm going to suggest to you, uh, rather hesitantly, a, a contention about what I see as the changing regimes of governance in Northern Australia. Uh, I, I think that these are happening in Australia generally, but I think they're happening in particular ways in Northern Australia, and I think they're happening with more uh, urgency in Northern Australia. Um, so it's, it's my beginning proposal of making, of, of how we might work towards a, a frame for a collection of stories. Now, I'm uh, writing a, a book that was really begun by my disconcertment about ecosystem services. Uh, and as part of this, I, it took me a long while to, ex to sort of articulate it to myself, I suppose, but I, I came, I had this rather shocking recognition that the Australian government, uh, it has a mappable native or a mappable territory out there, and it has a population that sits in that territory or nature or a society that is separate to that um, nature, which um, we might call. Well, uh, in fact, someone has actually named it, and, and that is called uh, Nation Making 1.0. Um, and this is an article in CSIRO's uh, Eco. I think it's, it's an Eco. It's a popular um, environmental journal called Ecos. That's what it is. And this. Journalist proposes that we are now in uh, Nation Building 2.0. Uh, so there's been a, a new operating system has been brought, put in place. Uh, is her, uh, this journalist's contention? So taking that uh, contention seriously, that we have a new operating system, Nation Building 2.0. I recognise that in uh, that operating system, nature is no longer territory to be mapped, but it is infrastructure to be intervened in. And uh, in that nature, that nature is not distinct from society. Uh, so in Nation Building 2.0, to use this metaphor, um, Australia is the infrastructure, and the role of government is to, uh, to the best of, to the best means it has, design interventions, 
and then intervene and then evaluate interventions. Uh, and of course, most of all, it likes to buy, first of all, designs for interventions and then buy services to implement those interventions and buy services to evaluate those interventions. Um, so, uh, recognising not that nature and society, territory and population had gone away, but sitting alongside it was this ever-expanding uh, Australia, Australian political polity as infrastructure. Now, this is not infrastructure that's ever knowable as a vast, vague whole, but it's only ever knowable as small um, nexi. nexi nexuses um, or nodes uh, and so this is the this is in a way everybody accepts that the only way to know this infrastructure is to know little nodes uh, of its working um, so uh, so in addition um, we've got this dynamic melded nature society already happening uh, in governance. Okay, so whereas territory and population uh, can be mapped and petitioned <coughs> with categories that are stable um, and um, sets of political technologies, if you like, uh, practices of making knowable um, that end up in representations, uh, we've also, of course, so that form of government still keeps going. Um, but we also have uh, places where territory and population, nature and society, uh, have become into infrastructure that might be interfering. Um, and so uh, I suggest that we're seeing the emergence new sets of knowledge practices, new sets of practices for making knowable, <coughs> um, and one of the ways of thinking of this, or one of the ways of naming this new political uh, technology is to say it proceeds through counting on non-Euclidean fingers, which is the phrase I got from uh, Brian Rocken. Um, and so objects of governance are being born uh, in, in this new sort of framing. Uh, and I think uh, these objects of governance, um, there are special tricks by which they can both uh, be part of, if you like, nation building 1.0 and part of nation building 2.0. So it's, um, there are ways of uh, trafficking between these two regimes of knowability, uh, and I think we need to know a lot more about that trafficking uh, because a lot of political questions get asked and answered in that trafficking between uh, the population, territory, and infrastructure. And uh, if we, so this is why I think it's useful to suggest that we do have, um, that, that we see these as different, different. It's useful to see them as different, which is not to say they can't be connected in particular ways. <coughs> so um, those predictive numbers that you were talking about, which are not indexable, they come out of world making 2.0. Yes. So just something different altogether yes. from what we've always been used to doing. Yeah. yeah. But just thinking about um, like the James Price point thing as an example of government trying to do a sort of nation building 1.0 turned into a 2.0 kind of argument where you know Nil Nil and Jabra Jabra people all of a sudden had a stake in trying to say actually we're part of this big thing. So it wasn't, it was the infrastructure as you pointed yes. out to be. The arguments change in the way that people need to do their work in those things change. And so yet yeah, things can re-emerge as important 
players in a way that just would have been dismissed previously. Yes, yes. So, so it's slightly scary, but it's also an opportunity to um, rethink. Um, but unless we get a bit busier, a bit quicker, uh, we, commentators, participants who uh, uh, are, have a different sort of vested interest, if you like, the, the Aboriginal landowners or the guest stakeholders, and we've still got vested interests but they're different, um, and we do different, make different products. We've sort of been on a back foot for quite a while. Okay, so um, is then uh, Northern Australia, or the Northern Australian polity, an infrastructure that might be intervened in, as well as being a territory and a population? Um, and if we do want to propose that as a contention, what might be pulling us towards that new working imaginary of governance. Um, I, I think part of it is a sense of coming to the end of some sort of tether. I think climate change uh, is really a climate change discourse uh, and the beginning of the material engagement with recognition of climate change. Is might be we might want to think of that as the end of a tether of modernity, uh, some sort of tether in modernity, um, and um, related to um, today's reading, this notion of disaster planning in risk management, uh, the notion the notion of infrastructure is all the way through risk management uh, work and talk um, and this disaster planning, which uh, Lukoff and Collier point out, we can, <coughs> we can identify an origin of it in the Cold War uh, story. <coughs> uh, but um, that makes it sound rather exotic. But uh, after the after the 2009 bushfires in Victoria, uh, disaster. Um, what are they called? They called rapid uh, assessment, uh, rapid infrastructure assessment teams, and, and team teams of from various. Corporations, teams composed of individuals from various organisations, both private and public, just go into a disaster area for seven days and they have seven days to identify uh, the, the parts of infrastructure that are dangerous or broken. Uh, they made no distinction between natural infrastructure and social infrastructure physical infrastructure and um, immaterial infrastructure. Uh, uh, they're concerned with mental health as much as with power lines. Uh, they're concerned with there's no distinction between private and public property. Uh, it's just an infrastructure with holes in it, basically. Uh, and they put a price on what it costs to fix these holes in the infrastructure. And to do that, uh, uh, there's a huge database, uh, presumably on a computer in Melbourne somewhere, uh, and it tells you the price of uh, fixing three kilometres of road that have been washed away to, um, or, and it tells you the price of flying in five consultants to attend to mental health issues uh, and five um, uh, ministers of religion uh, or such like. Uh, so everything, it's, it's like a huge virtual supermarket with everything costed uh, 
and this is there as a database for these rapid assessment teams to assess the cost of fixing the infrastructure that's been damaged by the disaster. So, um, you know, it's, ha it's happening here and now. That's just normal work uh, these days. Uh, the, the bushfires CRC and natural disasters CRC <coughs> said that um, Elspeth's involved and must be doing a lot of that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so that's what I mean by disaster planning, that, that those innovations in administration. Um, I think in Northern Australia the intervention had this uh, inadvertent effect of constituting Northern Australia as an infrastructure where places and people are constituted as one entity. It was uh, it was a disaster. You know, there was a disaster in early childhood, uh, in, in the situation of early of young children in Aboriginal communities. So, so it was, uh, and a, an intervention associated with a disaster, uh, and it had the effect of really quite suddenly constituting the, this infrastructure. Or Northern Australia is an infrastructure. Um, the policy of enterprise development. So, um, governments these days uh, are promoting enterprise development of all scales, of all sizes, by everybody. Even a worker uh, is constituted as an enterprise centre, okay? a single worker. Uh, is constituted as a centre of enterprise development. Uh, and um, it goes all the way from constituting workers as enterprises to constituting gas plants. Um, I mean, it's the same ontology. Um, and then I think there's uh, this notion of uh, we now. <coughs> We don't actually have, don't need so much of going out and measuring the growth rate of long and corals. In other words, we don't need to go out and do that work that will underlie the indexicality because we have so many data points uh, that are constituted uh, as big data in multiple ways uh, that governments uh, can interrogate. Data and model, and, and use model to, to generate uh, facts for Nation Building 2.0, uh, which are um, <coughs> facts constituted not as indexical. Um, Michelle Sayers got this image of a handkerchief in, in, in making this distinction. He says, uh, Imagine a handkerchief that's ironed flat, she's a very dapper person. Um, imagine that handkerchief is <coughs> ironed flat, um, and this is our indexical world. But imagine that handkerchief crumpled to put in your pocket, um, and uh, points that were far away from each other uh, suddenly become very close. Uh, points that were uh, constituted on one side of the handkerchief suddenly find themselves uh, sitting next to the other side of the handkerchief. So, so it's an image that um, tries to make topology uh, more understandable. So if we could, we could say Nation Union 2.0 really is the crumpled handkerchief version uh, in, in that way. Maybe we should call them um, that suggests a randomness in yes. the crumpled handkerchief model as opposed to folding a handkerchief to put in your pocket. Yes, which is a way of um, doing your um, indexicality in a, in a different way. And there's a lot of modelling that is done in that in that way. So modelling doesn't 
doesn't quite name a difference. Um, but modeling using uh, topological relations uh, uh, is what we need to specify. Okay, um, so. What does that mean? Topology? Yes, well, yeah, what does modeling with topological, topological relations? relations. Um, I can't quite explain it because I don't really get it fully. Um, but uh, like a Mobius strip uh, is a. An entity with one surface that can actually be modelled, represented in two dimensions. But um, th there are other. So, so it's it's about think it's about modelling relations between points on a surface uh, using more than two dimensions or three dimensions. Right, could you say that it's modelling that no longer just depends upon the relation between the numbers but other sorts of qualities yes. um, that are often hidden or implicit? Um, I think in part because you can't model everything. So you think you're following an energy but actually you're controlling it because you don't have all the points on the energy yes. to join together so you end up with something that is to be telling you this is how it is, but actually there's so many of the components that you're not ever going to end up with all the yeah. So, so it's recognising the possibility of the, the modern dream, if you like, of exhausting mapping of the world, which is, was embedded in Bacon's vision 400 years ago. <coughs> Can I just ask about the enterprise development, only because I think it's very relevant to what I was thinking about with the financial literacy and, and what Julie's thinking about with the feasibility study and even what Anthony's thinking about with the resource centre and how it's changing. Is there something there to do with um, how governance has been outsourced to um, remote northern Australia in ways that um, reimagines them as sort of capitalist enterprises. Is there something to do with that? Yeah, capitalised enterprises. Yeah. But I, I, and for for a long time, I was completely transfixed by the market and, uh, as driving this. But but I, I think it's only one. I now think it's it's one just one strand. It's certainly a very strong strand of uh, neoliberalism. Um, and when you turn things, when, uh, when you turn workers into uh, capitalised enterprises, uh, education becomes a means of individuals constituting their capital out of which they are going to constitute themselves as centres of enterprise. So education becomes something quite different. And, and this goes back to the, um, the theory, I suppose it was, of human capital that was really all the rage in the 70s. And in the next year, Foucault, sort of almost inadvertently ends up devoting a whole series of lectures to this horror, as he sees it, of uh, the emergence of human capital. So if we, if we could keep going, we would move on to uh, the next governmentality book, the 78, 79 lectures, uh, which Um, really, so in '77 he sees neoliberalism emerging, but I, I think it's wrong to to really uh, emphasise neoliberalism as a political, as the the political agent in all this, because I think there's there's a lot more. 
sort of pushing us than just you know and marketization. I used to work um, in a department where we translate policy to scientists and science to policy makers. And it was quite interesting because I guess a model is something that, you know, it, it extrapolates. So red sky at night, shepherd's delight, that's a model. So you're saying, you know, if it's going to be a red sky, it's going to be sunny. And people knew that before they knew the science behind it. And it's the same as, you know, if the flower, certain trees flowering, it's a good time to get turtles. Like, that is a model. But I think what happened was, so the scientists are so happy with that, they can look at it. And models can be useful, like, you know, everyone uses GPS. And that's a model, because the, the Earth isn't completely round. So you've got to have models to work out, you know, make that work. And so there is usefulness in models, and I think as well, you know, looking to the future, I guess people are saying, okay, well, we need to build a marina here, so it's going to bring in so much money from jobs and building it and everything. And so the other side needed an economic argument, so they needed to say, okay, well, it's going to bring in this much money, but you're going to spend this much money because it's going to affect the way the coastline moves, so you're going to have to dredge and you're going to have to put in all these coastal defences, and that's going to cost you this much money. So that was a defence, so that's quite useful, but where it comes perverted, I guess, is that the policy makers, so the scientists can say, okay, we're quite happy, we can do this, and they'll always work on probabilities, or, um, so they'll say, we're, you know, 90% certain this will happen, working on all our errors and all our data, but, you know, when the data gets a bit rubbish, you know, rubbish in, rubbish out, you can't make something for nothing. So that's like, we're only 10% certain that this is going to happen. But the policy workers, they want facts, like on the poster, they want to say, you know, we want to show people something certain and something great. So the policy makers ask the scientists questions they can't answer, but the scientists need a job, so they need to you know, no one's going to pay them to do something that's not useful. So they're like, well, this is the only way we're going to get money. So they just make up a load of rubbish because that's what they're paid for. They're not paid to do objective science. They're paid to come out with a number that policymakers can put on a poster. And I guess that's where it's got perverted, really. It's the funding model rather than anything else. Like, it's not the model in itself, but because I guess, you know, you all know, um, like you start off with a really good idea, but the funding isn't paying you for that idea, it's paying for you for some bizarre policymakers thing they've put up in their head, so you're like, okay, we'll do that because that's the only way I can get money. So that's where the perversion lies, not in the science, but in the funding model like how everything is funded. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I, I think there's something very peculiar about your unknown unknowns where you just don't know, and then still having to say, but I'm 10% certain. I think that's a really bizarre yeah. moment. Yeah, like, because, I mean, I even in, like yeah, even when you're measuring a coral, so I say you're measuring a coral, like when you're out there, you've got the tide going, like these corals grow incredibly slowly, so, your difference is in a millimetre, and when you've got a tape measure there and you're in the tide like this, <laughs> like it's not a certain, so you can say, okay, it's 15 cents, but in reality, it, it's not, everyone likes certainty, but even in that thing which seems very solid and very certain, it's not, and so this is just an extension of that, but you can say, okay, when this plant flowers, you know, most of the time that's a good time to get turtles, but it's not 100% accurate 100% of the time. And every layer that you add, every, when you're... Yeah. So when your model, as your model gets more complex, then you're multiplying all those unknowns. And that's where you get some ridiculous thing that means nothing. But that's what people are paying for. So they're paying for a number. 
they don't care, because no one reads the science report, it's like, you know, it's a big boring like thing, but no one kind of reads it. Like, if you look at how much people read peer-reviewed journals, it's kind of like, they get read once or twice or something, like, no one reads it, no one cares. What they care about is the poster with the numbers on it, and so that's, that's what people pay for. Well, it's just interesting that the two things could happen in that model that you're talking about. That each little bit of um, uncertainty can ramifies out to a massive uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Whereas the other version would be the more different kinds of data you can put together, you know, one of them doesn't need to be 100% accurate on its own. If you gather enough different kinds of data around something, you can say, you know, if the cross reference the flowers with the Clouds and the something else that ants walk on the ground. I don't know. But if you did, it, if you could do all of that, then you could actually get a more accurate picture, in a sense, from more data. Yeah. So the more you add in, but, the more accurate it is. But, but it also, also maybe that, more inaccurate. Yeah. In sense. It has that level of uncertainty. So that's just and science is always manner, and so it always works on probabilities, but. It's the crossover between the science and the policy, where policy don't want that uncertainty, and they won't pay for that uncertainty. So the scientists will say to the policymaker, "Okay, well, we, from the data we've got, because like even climate change in this country, like we've only been collecting data for maybe 50 years, so we've extrapolated, you know, 300 years into the future on 50 years worth of data, and so a lot of it." is complete rubbish. Like, some of it's good, but a lot of it's total just rubbish. And that's because that's what people have asked for, that's what people pay for. Do you think any of that matters? Like, I wonder if there's a political rationale that this is coming from, whether the truth, is, the truth <laughs> of projections <laughs> matters at all. Maybe all that matters is that you've got, you're identifying this infrastructure, and your infrastructure in the context of climate change is your rivers, but it's also your rainfall and your temperature. And actually, and the means for measuring them. And yes, and the means for measuring them. And what matters is actually having all those components in place and the authorization to intervene in them, regardless of what happens actually in the future. This, this I don't know, technology of knowledge or this rationale of climate change and adapting to climate change and developing the north all just authorizes you to get in and start messing around with all that stuff. And you think of it as an infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You don't think of it, I mean, because uh, of things like models and, yeah. and other things, yeah. So, so my suggestion is, does it help um, uh, if we <coughs> sort of say, okay, ma maybe what we're seeing is this working imaginary of governance uh, that is rendering or taking Northern Australia as infrastructure. Uh, an infrastructure that can be intervened in and intervened in through the agencies of objects um, or entities, um, including subjects. Um, so, so, and will this provide a useful tension that will enable at least some of us to sort of write stories about our objects uh, and will it? Uh, provide a useful connecting thread uh, if we're all attending to this idea that maybe uh, governance is for intervening in an infrastructure. We, could we be finding that some objects play into that really beautifully, like the, the little swallowable thermometers? that send out information that plays into a model, whereas still be quite conservative objects like old buildings that resist, that, will, that can be drawn into infrastructure, but they will, they'll, they'll apply a sort of break on too much um, well, speculation. Well, I suspect that building is going to uh, 
give such agency to the enterprise of the new. Mm, but it's going to have it's going to have a lot of it's going to it's going to it, it exert a, mm -hmm. a, a lot of influences which might be counterproductive to that enterprise model that the government's got. Of, mm -hmm. of, um, it's interesting because I've got no attachment or understanding that building claim picture in my mind, so to me it doesn't exist. Sorry, you know, no, no. The building doesn't exist yeah. to me. It doesn't but exist. to the community it does, you see. To you it does. And to me mm. it does. Yes. Yeah. So we because have to. We've lived with it for 12 years. So our how do, yeah, so that's an interesting thing too. Mm. So, Helen, what you're saying is that under um, World Building 1.0, the, the building had a particular life and um, existence and it, nature. Had a, it was probably con constituted mainly through a cartographic imaginary. Right, yeah. And now it's that been... Cartographic. Yeah. But now there's the potential for it to be understood in a new way. Yes, that's right. Which will... Uh, its, its physical location, all its physicalities, uh, will be ignored until something. But I'm I'm interested yes. in the way those physicalities are going to exert themselves yes. and say, you know, you want to have this wonderful open relationship between Ballander and Yongu, but look, this building's got all these little offices. You know what's going to happen? Those doors. Are but and also, the, it's got, got all the, the stories side. that are embedded in this as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you couldn't build an organisation with a hundred staff in a building that's only mm -hmm. 20 minutes by 10 minutes, unless mm -hmm. you want this or something. So, yeah, it has effects. So, if, if I think of the, f the fire that, that um, was imagined as a, you know, in the grant application, uh, it was imagined as a sort of pretty ordinary, uh, precise cartographic object. It would begin here, burn, go there, uh, burn for so long, uh, and then uh, the a whole lot of properties of, of that fire, like it, it burnt. Uh, it burnt leaf litter to such and such a depth that constituted. Uh, uh, it was a hot fire. Um, no one would have measured the temperature, but they would. Uh, there'd be various signs about how hot it was, and so on. So it's got these properties. Um, but um, in in a infrastructure vision, uh, uh, that fire is actually constituted as a risk. And uh, it's, it's not a cartographic object anymore. So, and as a risk, it has quite different sorts of properties. Uh, it'll cause this much damage, and it'll, this percentage of our economy will be influenced. Yes, in, for good or bad, or. Mm, yeah. But that's what you you would be thinking about that retrospectively after the right. workshop. Yes, yes. So I'm. Um, this is based on an ethnographic experience of 1996. Really. Um, so it's a long time ago now, and no one was thinking of nature as infrastructure in 1996. So it's. Maybe that's fictio criticism. So you might write the three thousand words and say this is what it looked like then and this is what it looks like now. I could do that, or I could uh, um, just tell it as a story, as, as an imaginary story. But from the two point zero point of view. Yes. Yeah. In, in government intelligence one of my nature is very much a resource to be interfered with and, and used. So by societies that sit within it. Because when you characterise something as a risk, 
to that state which was previously an object becomes a process? Why? I don't know. Well, it's a different sort of <coughs> object. Mm -hmm. It has. Oh, yes, sorry. An object in that. Yes. Yeah. And it actually has intensive properties rather than extensive properties. But I can also see the space that's not fire, the not fire, because yeah. to Indigenous people not to have a fire is a risk, possibly. Sure. You know, so there's a, it's like a the space that leaves is also. And, and so clearly the question is, well, if, if governance is thinking, if thinking about infrastructure, how does that mesh with uh, Aboriginal imaginaries? Uh, does the infrastructure, is it easier to connect to uh, working imaginaries of your uh, understandings, or is it harder? It's certainly different. Yes. Um, Do we need to have So both, both ways becomes, <laughs> there's clearly got to be more than both. So, well, both, both ways is possibly a, a not very useful simplification. So, so straight away when you talk about infrastructure, you're sort of talking about anti-matter or anti-infrastructure or something that's not... Well, yes. A lot of weird things happen. Do you know the etymology of infrastructure? Because I'm just thinking it's a weird word because it's not quite just structure, it's not just mm -hmm. uh, things that are established and never changed, yet they have this changeable, connected quality. Yeah, it's to do with making. I mean, it's okay. etymology goes back to making, and it goes back to structure. And infra uh, is moving inwards. So, so this is the other funny thing that happens, is that there's no remove judging observer position mm -hmm. as there is in mapping or cartography. Mm -hmm. yeah, it, yeah, it comes from the Latin below. Yeah, the below or under part of the body or something. Infra? Infra. Mm -hmm. It's a sort of enabling, isn't it? So the, the government talks about yeah, we're going to invest, how government is investing in infrastructure, we're going to invest in infrastructure. And it's given that the jobs that go along with the building is a great thing, but it's actually it's a vehicle to swan you on something like that. But beneath the surface somehow, something that's beneath. Going inside, it's the, it's the opposite of meta, if you know. It's a really interesting version because for, for, there's been that whole movement that's cried out against modernity. <coughs> said reality is not like the iron handkerchief, it's like the comfortable handkerchief. You're, you're not recognising the relationship between, to, you know, to say to the scientists, you're not recognising the relationship between the, um, you know, the crying child and the, and the economic figures and all, and all these interesting but of course they are. I mean, it's the scientists who are using the crumpled handkerchief. Sorry? The scientists are using the crumpled handkerchief. So, uh, so I'm saying it's, it's like a reversion yeah, right. yes. to, to this, a, a, a sort of reversion to wholeness. To, to the, yes, to this. that's exactly what it is. It's a, it's a shift to a different form of um, generalisation. So, in terms of a methodology, like for example, in the in the in the in the Aboriginal Aboriginal Corporation, we looked at feasibility studies in the past, and we and I um, looked at all the components, the sort of five main areas that you need to look at: the marketing, the all the first different areas, and then looked at all all these kinds of questions that that, that are typically asked in a feasibility study, and made up a bit of a framework, and then our to try because it's a new thing for us, so trying to and, and trying to manage the expectation of, of government and what they're expecting to get back and what and also the expectation of the community and what the community is expecting to have and trying to manage all of these different kinds of expectations. But I'm just wondering and, and, and we've got a time frame that's short and a small amount of money, very small to do this to do this in. But I'm just wondering um, 
like, and, and that sits there, and then what sits over here is this sort of thought all the time is that should we just be collecting stories, just talking and just getting people's stories about what they're imagining or what what this might be, as opposed to directing that through some sort of framework where we're answering um, questions. So, uh, you know, I'm trying to be trying to work and, out... And, a, a, and that, if you put a, that question in, in infrastructure terms, yeah. you might say, uh, are we thinking of infrastructure as just a um, whole lot of nodes in which we might design a clip-on for here? Yes. A, 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 something slotty and something there? Yes. Or do we have this fancy that we can uh, understand the infrastructure as a whole, um, increasingly people are giving up that fantasy and saying, oh, we're, 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 there's this little node, and if we design this um, little module to clip on there, uh, that, that'll influence the infrastructure. So uh, I think rather than imagining representations that are true or not, um, people mm -hmm. are sort of they're thinking much more with their fingers, I think, in an infrastructure model, and they're saying, Is it tinkering? You know, if we just pull that a bit by clipping that in, well, that'll, that might, and, and so, and this is where projections and models come in, that will alter, alter that tension, and if we pull on that, and so on, so, um, modeling and infrastructure thinking um, go very strongly together. And the fact that we were asked to do a feasibility study means that we're being treated as part of the infrastructure as yes. well. Yes, and we're being asked to produce the model. But we are the infrastructure. You, we are the infrastructure, yes. Mm. This all isn't peculiar to North Australia, is it? I mean, oh, not at all. Much but I, I think it's got a particular flavour in Northern Australia mm -hmm. and, and a particular... Uh, it's more evident here, if you like, uh, because there's less of the old in place and it's always been more contested by having Aboriginal Australians on the ground to contest it. So it's more sort of seeable here, I, I think. It's more of a reach to yeah. I can see how, say, the objects that Mel and Michael chose could really belong in this sort of discussion <laughs> about what, <laughs> what, what about, say, a, gentle, a very gentle object like Jenny's painting with its very subtle Governing influence. How would that fit into this story? Jenny, anyone? To be honest, I was struggling to see it. Right, okay. Yeah. That, that, that object um, is part of the market. Uh, and mm -hmm. actually, a lot of this infrastructure thinking is actually being worked through the emergence of art markets. Mm -hmm. uh, so, that, that painting, uh, despite uh, Everything else is also uh, part of an entity in an art market, um, and that uh, uh, that way of, it doesn't have a choice. It is, um, and um, so the, and that constitute that that object very very differently, and the object that we met in your story, uh, we'll have to have some either connect or refuse to connect uh, in one way or another with that object which it is. sort of an interface yes. in a way between what the object might be in itself and how it's functioning. 
uh, well, I, I, I think the object in itself is so many, many things, and I, I think um, the object in itself uh, just uh, fractures into many, uh, and so what that thing, the, the relations between the, the multiplicity that the object inevitably becomes. And it was already a multiplicity because it was in Albert Namatira's world uh, and in other people's mm -hmm. worlds. So it was already um, constituted as multiple in a, in a really interesting way. Um, and that multiplicity of the object is just proliferating. Mm -hmm. I think that what I'm finding difficult because of um, having a sort of an internal view of the situation yeah. um, is that, you know, as a maker, I tend to see it from inside, yes. um, predominantly. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, you're aware of how of a, a painting as a player. Um, but when I when I kind of speak for it, the tendency is to go inside, to yeah. speak from mm -hmm. the inside, and I just am not sure whether that's... Um, but would it have even been made if there wasn't an art market? Um, not like that, no. No, it's certainly not it's clear in, in Albert's case. Maybe you should um, imagine looking at the people who are looking at you, some of the people who are looking at you, and yet the Armageddon Centre is really interesting, as you mm. well know, in terms of the different fantasies of all the different people come along and mm. looking at those things out on the lawns around the church, you know, mm. and they're looking in there, what are they... Yeah, well, I can only imagine what they might be seeing, but it just yeah, it's so many things and those, particularly things like an image of works, yeah, they're doing something internationally significant in terms of telling stories about gum trees and mm -hmm. Aboriginal people in Central Australia. Yeah. So I think the very fact that you're saying I move inside is really really significant. Um, that that's I and mean, I think if you just uh, tell your story, if you problematize, if you think about what it is this moving inside is, uh, I think that would be really interesting. Okay. So you don't you don't have to connect to the art market at all, okay. but um, well, but just think of the way in which your story is um, moving to an inside. I mean, there are many insides, of course. Yeah. And even the, the maker of, a, of an artwork like that, you know, the make, um, that, that uh, of course, you know, the claim is that that's just one inside, or that the story that Linda might tell uh, is just one of many. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, are the joining, um, I think the joining, I to say, this kind of a glue for me and thinking about it is um, is thinking about desire. So I think about uh -huh. the desire yes, of the design. painting, yeah. what, what the painting wants. I think about what Albert wants and about what the viewers want. Yeah, that's and, nice. Yeah. 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 It's a political technology. The problem that I think of desire as a political technology. Uh -huh. I think it can actually serve as a set of practices of no ability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think yours is one of the easy ones. <laughs> 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 well, it's probably. <laughs> so, so you could relate those to practices of desirability, creating desirability. Mm -hmm. I'm coming back to my own thing, but sometimes yeah, I found it really interesting hearing what Jenny was saying because it gave me some ideas. Taking your eye off your own stuff is really yes. helpful. Mm -hmm. But um, so there's a tension there between, for example, in the Roman Guinea Corporation, between the desire to have this thing <coughs> and what the government want to know is the okay, the desire's there. And does the government desire it? Everybody desires it, in fact, to the point that they've already funded it yeah. pretty much before mm -hmm. it's even got the feasibility study. 
but the reality of it. And there's this sort of what's this re- reality, and is there a tension there or not? And why are we doing it if we're still in the study? You know, like there's a whole lot of questions. Yeah, and I think Helen's point might be that the reality is changing. It's changing yes. from one reality to another reality, and that change might be the particular tension that helps us to see what these objects are doing. And all those words have itty on the end. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't go there. And it is state, I mean, it's a suffix of state of being. Yes. So, an Aboriginal corporation, like an Aboriginal housing association, of which there used to be 65 or something in the Northern Territory, is actually a different sort of um, political technology than what the government's actually imagining now because of the new sorts of the appropriation of um, nature into the into the scheme of things. So and the houses and tenants are different entities. Yeah. So the tenants are different entities. So do you think that thinking about 1.0 and 2.0 is a useful way of I, I think it is. Yeah. It, the um, the journalist who wrote this article about one point nation building one point zero, nation building two point zero, um, she is a direct descendant of Australia's first capitalists. Now, not many nations know their first capitalists, but we do. Um, they, they were John and Mary MacArthur. Not Mary, Ma. Elizabeth, sorry, John and Elizabeth MacArthur. And this woman's name is Jacqueline MacArthur. Uh, and uh, she writes with the certainty that comes with being one of Australia's core families. Should we read that article, do you think? Well, um, um, it's a very tiny little article. Um, and, and she's arguing, she's worried about climate, climate change, she's very keen, of course, on expanding the market. Because uh, they're incommensurable. Mm-hmm. They're really <laughs> <Yes. laughs> um, and so uh, she's, the, the article, it's a very short article in a popular government funded magazine. Uh, and she writes as if, well, everybody knows that we're now in nation building 2.0. She's the woman who launched Earth Hour. Mm-hmm. So she's a publicist mm-hmm. and an activist. Did you ask before if we got that the government imagined infrastructure? Was it a question? I think one of the points is that we, that as Alan as Helen was saying before, that there's no longer the judging observer. That we look at, at, at the work of trying to do a feasibility study. We need to think of ourselves as not so much reporting to government, even though that's what we're doing, but also as being part of the sort of major the, the whole plan of. of um, um, just a little plug-in. Okay. Do one. A plug-in. A plug-in. With attempts to intervene in the infrastructure in a small way. Yeah. It certainly helps to see why the government so often pays for a consultancy report and you come up with all these recommendations and just completely disappears. It's not actually like they want to know what the answer to the question is. They just think of asking the question is a part of what we do as a government. Yeah, but actually, by the time you've answered the question, now onto something else or it's all changed. Or, so it means that the work that we do in answering questions has to be much more generative um, yes. and interventional. Yes. Yeah, well, that's the case with this feasibility. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Sorry. Uh, I'm feeling very upset because I've realized that I've just got involved in another <laughs> new medical intervention this project because we just wrote an article in the conversation about the Conservatives 2030 vision for Northern Australia about you know building 100 dams and how great that will be and how much that will be done really easily and stuff. And we were writing saying you know you haven't even considered climate change and all these things might not be feasible at all. In order to contest this seeing Northern Australia as infrastructure and saying actually, you know, you can't just put all these dams in. But in doing that in the framing in the way that we've had, we've actually invited more of an infrastructural perspective because we're saying you have to get even more involved in understanding all these bits that make up the infrastructure of Northern Australia. So we've actually have we actually just made it worse. We're invited to more invasive technology. But we're not posing this as a, a bad mm -hmm. or a good move. It's not, it's, it's not that if you become more... But we're asking, oh, we're, we're making the world of this country. I'm sure back you've encouraged them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the anarchist slogan, don't vote, it only encourages them. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we could have said, this is a world of mess that belongs to other people just don't get involved at all. And we didn't say that. What we said was, you don't know if your manner of intervention is actually appropriate to be successful. So we've actually all we've done is, even though in speaking that language, we were probably do, doing it from the perspective where we really think you should do this at all. But we didn't say that. We were brave enough, actually, to say that. Yeah, yeah. And so I think every time we try, and we're not brave enough, we actually... Mm. But we have to engage in this infrastructure, this dialogue about infrastructure, it's not its not like it's something bad, it's, it's neither bad nor good, it's what's happening. So that's where you've got to engage, is that a reasonable... Yeah, and it's, um, it's not going to go away, just like National Women 1.0 is not going to go away. And, uh, but you don't have accept its terms yeah. and I think that's what it is. Because it's, it's the alternative. Yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. what the mm -hmm. it's what the yucky uh, consultants very often do. They have, they just refuse to accept the terms mm -hmm. uh, and say this is a question about how we should do. You're asking the wrong question. Mm, we were talking about um, Michael said something we were talking about mosaics and you know the if you look at mosaic, you can look at the individual tiles, you can come back and see patterns in things that you know, that might be a third of them. And I think that at the end of the day, we have to remember we're just one of the tiles in the mosaic. We cannot make the mosaic by, through our agencies, one of the tiles into whatever we want. We play a role in the big picture and we have to work out how we do that well and how we can use things like this as ways of rethinking that, our place in the mosaic. But to expect that we can organise the whole mosaic through our agency as one of the tiles, I think, um, puts too much pressure on us and doesn't actually help us to see how we do our little bit of work that we do. I wouldn't go with the mosaic metaphor. I'd go with more of a complex network because all those tiles aren't the same size and they don't all get laid oh, at course. the same time and they don't, you know, so like there are certain things we can do when we recognise our moments. Yeah, the tessellation is probably not a very Oh, good but I see what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just that um, bathroom refurbishment yes. is kind of a <laughs> metaphor at the moment for everything. <laughs> metaphor 2.0, please. <laughs> but the, yeah, just in terms of my own stuff, the important thing for me is to remember, okay, what can I do? What is, what is it that this is helpful for me to do in the work that I do and the things that I do? So coming back from that, trying to... Just, and this is just my own particular tactic. Yeah, because that's what we have to do. We have to sit down and write. And this is going to be useful. And it's why it can be imagined. Yes. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Helen, can you please talk a little bit more about this idea of the new emerging working imaginary? The word imaginary. Yes. Um, it's... Michael and I used to... Sorry, this is a very specific. Example. We used it in that material um, cultures, 
paper. So maybe that's a paper to distribute. The idea is that um, if, you, if you think about practices as ontologically generative, in other words, they're generating new things, new types of things. But they do it in very ordinary ways, and so they do it through institutions, in various social relations or socialities. They do it through various materialities, like buildings, paintings. They do it through um, literacies and texts, and uh, very. And there's always some sort of uh, implicit um, understanding of what we're doing here. And, it, and it's a metaphysical commitment, um, and it's um, it has to be actively um, it's actively worked at, actively uh, told um, through through socialities, materialities, and textualities. And these are sort of, I'm using those words, I'm not using texts and things, things on them. because the working imaginary is, uh, well, Foucault talks about it too, and he says the working imaginary is in something like a library. But I think we've got a better, uh, I, the sort of people, who I listen to in trying to work out what a working imaginary is um, young elders. Um, so they're not the um, mm. metaphor, as people will call it, is an articulation of a working imaginary. Could you explain that, please? Uh, the, and, and um, uh, Aboriginal people will all the time, time say you've got another story to the place and, and um, so that's what working imaginaries are. Mm. Are you pointing towards the same thing that people were pointing towards when they used the word paradigm? No. Mm. I think paradigm is uh, not metaphysical. But um, well, Kuhn derived paradigm from Fleck's knowing communities. And Fleck had something like a working imaginary um, that uh, was there uh, in a that connected a, um, a knowing community. Something you said was is really um, sitting very uneasily with me, and that is that you said that there's always an implicit understanding of what we are doing here. And I'm not quite sure what you mean by that, because I don't have an ever or rarely have an implicit understanding of what I'm doing. Like it's, yes, well, it's more um, understand. you um, it's the understanding that that the working imaginary is being alluded to, I think, by the woman you talked to who said, not all these ways of doing it, only one. She, did, she can't say, she will, she's saying there is a working imaginary and as we go along we'll make this little step and that little step and this little step and that little step. Um, because we've got a, a vague sense of where we're going. But it's not something that's there to be discovered, is it? It's something no, that, that we're, that's it's emergent. emergent. It's, on, it's, yeah. it's emergent, that's yeah. what it's... So... It's, but it's your accident. Okay, so, she, so she's hinting at what might be coming emergent. She's hinting at the emergence. She, she's saying, uh, not all these... Not four or five ways. She's saying... Uh, She's, if you like, asserting the existence of this 
metaphysical thing we might call it working in magic. Yes, okay. At the risk of being simplistic, can we just say your imaginary is your ontology of the world and your power yeah. is your personality? Yeah, it, it's your uh, yeah. working ontology. Yeah, yeah. Chris Lee said something else, though, that came to mind then, and she said, how do we academics do work that does work? Seems to me there's a connection there. Yeah. Between that. Interesting. There's some kind of traction. But that, that you seen something. And the intervention. Yes. No. I think that the, just back to the clams, that the clam as a clam and the clam as an object of knowledge, it's, it's actually produced as an object of knowledge through work. Yes. And it could be all sorts of different objects of knowledge. And the way that it turns into a particular object of knowledge and not another particular object of knowledge is because of the nature of the imaginary that's at work doing that. Mm -hmm. So the imaginary is the thing that you can't see between the real and the symbolic in the Kantian sense. Mm -hmm. I think so it's important to think of the imaginary of governance rendering North Australia as an infrastructure is not what we think that the government is thinking. It's what's actually the, what we're swimming in, and we're all part of it. So it's, it's easy to keep. Yeah. Think so it's not an back. ideology. Yes. And every person might have a slightly different yeah. imaginary, and they all overlap. So we were all here, and we all felt that it was a really um, good thing for us to be here at this because it fitted in with our unarticulated working imaginary of what academics should sometimes do. Yeah. And our frustration that we're not being listened to when we just go through the traditional report process. And so we really need to rethink what our place is in the academy um, as well as consultants because otherwise we're just missing out. Our place in the infrastructure. Yeah. We're missing out on the goods mm. and getting the bads. We're getting lots of goods. <coughs> well, it's 11.30. What, what I wanted to do next really was have a look at the reading, which is I said yesterday. So not quite what I wanted, but it was all I could find at the time. I wanted something, I wanted a reading that would talk about infrastructure uh, and infrastructure as political technology. And uh, um, if we think, uh, I, I think um, this notion of risk management and disaster planning and vulnerability studies is one of the moments that that's uh, contributing to if you like the solidity of infrastructure thinking uh, and uh, so that, that we can I, I just thought it might be useful to actually have a look at um, some particular bits of that text I actually put the text up on the screen. The, the reference to the text? No, I'll, I'll put the text of the text oh, okay. up yeah. on the screen. And, and we can discuss. I mean, um, it, the aim is to uh, find a reading that will help us articulate this vague thing of working imaginary for infrastructure thing. discuss in particular uh, phrases and terms and moves in this text which I think might be helpful. So we should stop for morning tea.